Welcome to the fourth video in our series on joint and byproduct costing. In this video, we are going to have a look at our third method of allocating the joint costs, namely the net realizable value method. As with all previous videos, we will begin this video by revising the basic idea behind joint and byproduct costing. We will then understand the key ideas behind the net realizable value method. Once we have understood these key ideas, we will then look at a practical example in which we allocate the joint costs to the joint products using the net realizable value method. We will then consider the advantages and disadvantages of this method and conclude by discussing under what circumstances this method is suitable. Let us begin by revising the idea behind joint and bar products. As with any other manufacturing process, we take our raw materials, labor, and overheads, and we subject them to the manufacturing process in order to get a product out. However, unlike a single product process, we could get out two or three or even more products simultaneously from this process. For joint processes, we cannot distinguish between the different products until a specific point known as the split-off point. Before the split of point, we cannot trace the costs to the individual products, and therefore we need various methods in order to allocate the joint costs to the joint products. Finally, after the split of point, where the products are separately identifiable, the products may be subject to further processing. These further processing costs can be traced to the individual products to which they relate. So what is the net realizable value method all about? The key idea behind this method is that the joint costs are allocated to the joint products based on the net realizable value at the split of point. The concept behind this method is very similar to the sales value at split of point method, which we looked at in our previous video. However, instead of directly using the sales value at the split of point, we work backwards from the final selling price of the product by subtracting the further processing costs to arrive at the net realizable value at the split of point. This technique is very useful because not all products have an active market and available sales price at the split of point, so we need alternative techniques in order to calculate it. The assumption underlying this method is also the same as that of the sales value at split of point method, and that a higher net realizable value indicates higher costs. Let us use an example to see how the net realizable value method works. You should recognize this example from our previous videos. We have a company called Joint that produces three products in a joint process. The total joint costs amount to 400,000 Rand. Note that we have already deducted the net realizable value of any bar products in arriving at this 400,000 Rand. Always remember to adjust the joint costs for any bar products, scrap, and waste before allocating the joint cost to the joint product. We are then given details of the three products at the split of point when they become separately identifiable. We are given the output in units, the sales value per unit at the split of point, any further processing costs, and then a final sales value after further processing has taken place. Now remember, the idea behind the net realizable value method is that we allocate the joint costs based on the total net realizable value at the split of point. The net realizable value is calculated as the final selling price less any further processing costs. Therefore, in this information, we are concerned about the output, the further processing costs, and the final sales value. We can ignore the sales value at split of point. Our first step then is to calculate each product's net realizable value. How do we do this? The first thing we need is to get the unit produced and final sales value which are given in the scenario. 
Very importantly, it is the final sales value and not the sales value at the split off point. We multiply the units produced by the final sales price and we get the total final sales value. Now that we have the total final sales value, we need to identify our further processing costs. These were also given to us in the scenario. Then to calculate our net realizable value, we simply deduct the further processing costs from the total final sales value and we arrive at our net realizable value. Now that we have our net realizable value for each product, we can use this net realizable value to calculate the proportion of the joint costs that we allocate to each product. So for product A, it represents 255,000 Rand out of the total net realizable value of 605,000 Rand. This represents 42.15%. For product B, it is 200,000 Rand out of 605,000 Rand, which represents 33.06%. Finally, for product C, it represents 150,000 Rand out of 605,000 Rand, which is 24.79%. These percentages you will notice add up to 100%. You should remember then that the total joint costs to be allocated amounted to 400,000 Rand. We can use the proportions we just calculated to allocate this joint cost. So product A would be the joint cost of 400,000 Rand multiplied by the proportion of 42.15%. This gives us 168,600 Rand. Likewise, for product B, we take the 400,000 Rand and multiply it by the 33.06% to get 132,240 Rand. Finally, for product C, we take the 400,000 Rand multiplied by the 24.79% to get 99,160 Rand. If we then want to get the joint cost per unit, we take the joint cost allocated and divide by the number of units produced to get 11 Rand and 24 cents for product A, 6 Rand and 61 cents for product B, and 19 Rand and 83 cents for product C. Given what we have seen, let us consider the suitability of the net realizable value method. If we look at the advantages of the net realizable value method, we see that it addresses the problems we have encountered under the physical measures method. This method can be used when the outputs are measured in different forms, such as liters or kilograms, and our infantry will be correctly valued so that we don't need to write it down. Further, we also see that it addresses the disadvantage under the sales value at split off method. For the net realizable value method, we don't need to have a selling price at the split-off point. However, this method does have some disadvantages. First, the gross profit percentage for each product will be different. This is a debatable disadvantage, as some people feel that the products coming out of the same process should have the same gross profit margin. Other people, however, disagree and think that it should be different for each product. The second disadvantage of this method is that it assumes that the further processing costs add no extra sales value. This means that the only value the further processing costs add is the cost that it is incurred in further processing. Finally, as with the sales value at split off point method, the underlying assumption remains questionable. So given these issues, we need to ask when is the net realizable value method most suitable. It is suitable when we don't have a sales value at the split off point. When the assumption of a direct relationship between the net realizable value and the cost is logical, 
and when the further processing adds little in terms of sales value. This brings us to the end of the net realizable value method. Join us in our next video where we look at our final method, the constant gross profit percentage method. See you next time.